kind of the next topic we wanted to discuss is going to be around uh, integration. In the mid-market, uh, where I think this is really a, a great play, and when I say mid-market, we kind of talk about you know, companies that do about you know, up to a billion dollars in revenue. Um, we see a, a couple of very dominant ERPs, uh, mainly that's you know, my, uh, Oracle NetSuite and Microsoft's uh, Business Central, which is uh, the cloud version of kind of what uh, Microsoft Nav used to be. So uh, to talk about uh, integration, we have uh, Mike Cordell, um, and uh, if we could get uh, him to be the center of attention uh, on video. Michael, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure. I, I've known Michael for, for a number of years. So it's, uh, I'm really excited to have him here and uh, uh, answer some of these questions around integration. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Uh, awesome. Well, let's jump into it, right? Um, uh, a couple of things that I wanted to talk about. As I said, uh, mainly we see lots of NetSuite, we see lots of Business Central when it comes to kind of this mid-market uh, retail. Um, both of them have recently announced what I would call out of the box integration with Shopify. Uh, Microsoft has a connector built right into Business Central. Uh, in fact, if you provisioned ABC instance um, after it was announced, it would be right there, kind of out of the box. And then NetSuite uh, uh, some years ago acquired a company called Farapp and now offers uh, that as a connector. In fact, if you go to the uh, Shopify App Store, you will see both of those available uh, right there in the App Store. Uh, in addition to that, we also have these solutions we would classify as iPaaS, so integration as a, as a service, fully cloud. Um, when considering um, you know, integrating Shopify to one of these ERPs or maybe even something else. Um, how do you how do you choose? How do you how do you approach this this question with so many things you know available? Yeah, so so typically you're right. It falls into two categories. It'd be custom or pre-built, um, and and those solutions don't specific. First of all, they don't specifically align with the ERP or with the level of service that you're getting from the e-commerce site. So regardless of what you sign up for with for instance with Shopify and regardless of what ERP system you have you still have to make a decision across both custom and and pre-built and typically you're looking at cost you're looking at effort to maintain as well as to to build out scalability and, and performance and when you kind of address all those things across the board you can find a couple of different um, niches that would push you towards one direction or another and so the first thing comes down to how standard the e-commerce site is and how standard the ERP that you're connecting to are. If both things are pretty standard, then there's a good chance that the pre-built solution could be an option for you. So typically speaking, the pre-built solutions are there to help with whatever comes out of the box from either e-commerce or ERP, or hopingly they align. And so, um, so you could be a candidate for that. There, there are also some pre-built options which can be customized. So if you look at stepping from pre-built into custom sometimes extending your pre-built solution is an option um, and that's when you get back into cost and effort to build and maintain so when you look at cost for example of custom you're kind of looking at it from a holistic perspective and when you're looking at a pre-built solution you're looking to control your costs typically because the custom layer may not be initially as cost effective for you when you get into customizing that pre-built solution, now you have to consider what is that cost up front and what is the ongoing cost of that? Because typically speaking, that's gonna change your license fees, for example. So then you're really looking at things like scalability and performance. Am I customizing this once or am I gonna continue to customize over and over and over again? And what's gonna happen to my cost and my performance? And am I going to find myself in effect effectively what would be a custom solution? Uh, down the end of the line. So um, the nice thing about pre-built is that they are services. You're buying a service which has support built in. You're buying something where there's the expectation that you're going to get help from the middleware as well as from the e-commerce and the ERP side. And when you're looking at custom, you're looking to bring in a partner or to have a team of people that are going to support you in the same regard. But like you mentioned earlier with software as a service, you don't necessarily have that as a fallback. And if there are 
issues, they are yours to consider and how to how to remediate any of those issues as well. Um, so I think you know you kind of have to think about not just where you are today, but where you're going with this overall e-commerce integration to determine whether what you have today will work for you. And then when you look at it over time, whether you think that's going to be a good a good long term fit for you. Um, a good real life example of this would be that or there's something like a multi location inventory, which is standard in Shopify and most ERP systems would handle that out of the box. So the concept is there on both ends of it, but the connectors that are pre built typically don't handle multi location inventory, at least in terms of what the end result of it would be. So the user expects that they're going to be able to purchase something from one location or another, or the ERP expects that it's able to fulfill from one location or another, depending on like point to point shipping costs and things like that. If the pre-built solution doesn't factor any of those things in, the fact that they're both relevant on the ERP and the e-commerce doesn't make any difference. You still need to look at customizing your pre-built solution or building a custom layer in order to, to integrate both of those things. Um, so where do you start? You start with an assessment. You start with talking about the current and the long-term goals of the e-commerce site and the ERP system and making sure that they align. Um, and then from there, I think you can start to determine whether or not pre-built will work for you. Start with pre-built, figure out whether it's going to work because you can control costs with it potentially, and then look at whether you're going to get a massive benefit from going custom uh, in the long term. Um, thank you, Mike. Uh, so one thing that I would note is, you know, when you say custom and I pass, um, are you talking about actual development or um, kind of more, more on the configuration side? Yeah, typically, you're talking about configuration for a pre-built solution, which would be I pass, and you'd be talking about code and development for a custom solution. OK, yeah, that, that makes sense. And we generally like to steer away from custom code. So <laughs> I, from a, an implementation perspective, uh, we generally kind of like to have, um, you know, something either I pass or out of the box. Uh, but I, I understand when the requirements are so far out that uh, it does require customization. Um, I find it interesting you were talking about, you know, multiple locations on, on Shopify and ERP because we were um, uh, talking to um, a customer where that is, uh, you know, one of the issues that they're, they're looking to solve, um, where because there are multiple locations on both sides and they're trying to use the smarts of both systems to manage inventory, they're actually clashing um, and the connector just doesn't know what, what to do with it. So that said, um, how do we talk about where data sits and just the overall data requirements between ERP in Shopify, I mean, knowing that uh, Shopify does integrate and, and play fairly well with, you know, 33 PLs, uh, eBay, you know, other platforms, other apps. How do you determine where data needs to sit? Is Shopify the, the point of, of truth or is it is it the ERP? Uh, well, there, there are two main things with that. First of all, it's really important to remember that an e-commerce website is not a marketing website. So an e-commerce website is a sales channel. It's an engine that drives business process. You need to be thinking about things like taxes, shipping, fulfillment, returns, really complex business process things that don't necessarily relate back to uh, the user experience specifically, but they can affect the user experience. And then on top of that, you need to think about customer service. And when you look at those two things, the data needs to sit where the customer service team is going to be working. So if the customer service team is going to be in Shopify, for example, then I think it's really appropriate that uh, the data sit e in mirror in Shopify as it would be in the ERP system so that they have up to date real time information to work with the client around. If the customer thinks that they are kind of getting into a black hole where the, the support rep doesn't understand something, for example, if they call in, they're having an issue with a return or if they're trying to uh, monitor the status of an order, for example, on the website, then it's really important that the user experience drives where the uh, what the customer can see. And oftentimes that comes down to data and how real time it is. So I think you have to think about things like whether or not you're going to be integrating other components as well. You mentioned 3PL and taxes. So uh, certainly a lot of times we'll look at this like an integration layer 
So getting back to kind of tying this to the previous question, when you're looking at custom building integration, if you know that you're going to be integrating e-commerce plus 3PL, tax software, uh, shipping, logistics, fulfillment, all of that, if you're looking at integrating all of those things into an ERP system, then it's really worthwhile thinking about building an integration layer that can handle all of those things. The ERP should be the nucleus for that data. Where the data sits and how it gets pushed out to the individual channels, it really comes down to what the experience is for the person who's using them, I think. OK, cool. Yeah. Um, one question I, I had around that is, you know, what about like high volume clients? Um, I mean, do you see, uh, you know, maybe some platforms for integration working better? Uh, how do you solve that? I mean, what, what is a high volume client and when do you start to think about performance uh, in relation to these, uh, in relation to the integration, really? Immediately. So I'll plan for that. First of all, don't don't look at this as being a small business. It's going to just need to get updated over time. There are a lot of instances where we see people say, well, we think we're going to go to, we traditionally have been B2B, but we think we're going to make the jump into direct to consumer and we're going to just kind of see how it goes. Um, there's probably no better way to destroy your customer relationship than automatically jumping into D to C and then finding out later on that you can't handle the volume and that your integrations aren't built for you. These aren't two week projects that are going to just automatically spin up and and you're going to find success. So if you're if you're a good sized business and you're planning for the future, consider that scalability portion of what you're doing and make sure that when you do go high volume that you get great user experience. And I'll mention that uh, low volume clients don't require any less user experience, right? So for example, if you're looking at, you talked about furniture earlier, somebody is buying a large ticket item or it's a luxury brand or something like that, and your transaction volumes lesser on a daily basis, but the overall AOV could be higher, it's equally as important to provide a good customer experience because you need customer confidence in what it is that you're selling and how that's gonna portray from end to end. And people are gonna look at things like, What's the status of my order and how realistic is it for me to see um, when my order is going to show up or, you know, did my authorization and capture match and, you know, is the shipping going to be considered properly and things like that. So with high performance, excuse me, with high transaction volume and really thinking about performance and making sure you don't miss any tricks and making sure that all the integrations you have are working properly and that you're not missing any points of that. Your tax calculates properly, even at high volume. Your fulfillment and your shipping costs calculate properly at high volume. But in lower volume, I think it's equally as important to provide for a user experience if you're a, a high ticket item, for example. So if we're talking about that user experience um, and we want you know, as close to real time uh, as possible, um, I mean, are you seeing any issues just implementing webhooks and, and keeping it you know, as, as close to real time as possible? Uh, documentation generally talks about uh, still requiring like some some cron jobs to do a cleanup uh, because webhooks can can drop. Um, I mean, what what have you seen? What what would you recommend? I, I I think that oftentimes comes down to reliability and how often you've got people who are looking at the day to day operations because you know webhooks could drop. Uh, you can definitely get a benefit in terms of performance and outbound data and, and a lot more real time. Uh, the downside is if it if there's a failure, how quickly can you find it and patch it and get it back up to to the speed that it needs to be running? Um, if you're doing things on a timed sync, then it's more predictable and you know when you're going to get the data. Um, so probably from a um, transaction volume perspective, it may not be as appropriate to do that timed sync. Um, but then on the other side of it, you've got to make sure that you have somebody monitoring it. So webhooks are very difficult to see when there's a failure, so you have to make sure that you're testing on both ends pretty frequently. Yeah, I've definitely seen the issues where uh, webhook will will drop because essentially it, it stops stops functioning. You get an error message about it, mm -hmm. but it, it actually takes a little while to go and fix it mm -hmm. uh, to reconnect, um, and that's kind of where we see these these cron jobs or still requiring to have that cron job to be created. Um, and it can add a little bit of cost, right? Because you can kind of say, well, why do I need both? Uh, I can just have one, you know, or the other. And documentation does specifically say that you do need these 
uh, timer uh, integrations. But uh, you know, specifically, the reason I was asking about uh, you know high volume uh, customers is. Uh, you know, in, in a high volume scenario, your webhook stops working and between the time where uh, it stopped and your timer runs, you may have accumulated so many orders that now it takes too long to, to go in and throw everything up and right. um, you end up in a situation where you're just not able to ever catch up without, you know, some downtime and, um, you know, getting a human being involved, which uh, even though ChatGPT is uh, is available, I don't think it's it's able to fix those types of issues just but yet. I think practicality and planning is the key to that. So you know we talked about earlier, if you, a lot of people that we work with will get out of a busy season in November and December and decide that they're going to spend the year building and getting ready for a September October holiday season, for example. And they can work out all the kinks over the course of the year. When they get to the holiday season, they'll be ready. So this is a really good example of where you don't really understand what could fail until you get a good stress test and you don't really understand where the points of failure are until they're there. Uh, if you plan for this early in the year, for example, when you have a lower transaction volume, then you're not going to have much in terms of a hiccup when things go haywire. Um, and bringing in a human to deal with this, while it can be effective, can be slow and it can be expensive. And again, getting back to user experience, we're not really seeing that there's a lot of patience for customers at this point. Customers yeah. expect things to be flawless and they want it to be that way from the jump. So a breakdown in communication over the course of purchasing something um, can can cause there to be a loss of a sale. And for the most part, people expect they're going to be able to find that product somewhere else nowadays also. Uh, one last question uh, as we're getting pretty close to the end, uh, Michael. Um, REST versus GraphQL. I mean, we're seeing so much or in terms of a GraphQL push from, from Shopify. New API released, um, uh, actually part of the of the winter update, and that's only talking about GraphQL. I really didn't see anything about REST. Um, at the same time, we have lots of clients that have, you know, have built their integrations around REST. I mean, do you see that becoming a major issue? Uh, should we be planning on uh, investing in, in changes, uh, switching to GraphQL right now, or do, do you think there's a little bit of time um, left? I think there's a little time left. Um, I would say consider your website a living, breathing organism, not a, I built it, now it's going to work forever. So that goes back to scalability, that goes back to effort and maintaining and building keeping an eye on what you're doing. It's not just about whether transaction volumes change over time. It's going to come down to whether technology supports your business at that particular point in time. So there are performance gains and there are governance uh, limits that you can get around with uh, with GraphQL. And I think that's a really important way to look at it. Um, limitations could be introduced depending on what you're integrating as uh, not all things work together quite yet. But it's definitely worth keeping your eye on because that performance gain and, and that governance limit issue could be a benefit to you over time, uh, but I wouldn't throw away REST API just yet. That's uh, music to my ears. Um, <laughs> thank you. And that's a really great note to wrap this up on. Uh, I would agree with, with that assessment. I think we've, we've got a little bit of time, maybe a year, uh, maybe a little bit more uh, before uh, it, it will start to become a, a, a real push from Shopify to kind of switch this out. Uh, but at the same time, I don't expect that the legacy APIs will go away. I think just the new stuff will become only available on uh, GraphQL and just won't be getting those updates into the legacy APIs. So uh, thank you very much.